I want to free you from the burden of news and free you perhaps to find a way to be refreshed by news. I believe that that can happen by engaging the news with Christian order and balance and context. I do not assume that my ways of engaging the news and my frequency and my sources for engaging the news are the best ones for you. So I won't even go there. We have different abilities and proclivities and callings and stomachs. But I do want to consider with you the nature of news and what biblical principles we might rally to together when it comes to how to engage the news, not only as Christians, but in particular as pastors. So let me pray that for these moments here together. Father in heaven, we live in a world of so much news connected as we are across the globe with stories and accounts and intrigues. And Father, we want to be faithful Christians, first and foremost, and in this room, we want to be faithful pastors, whether we are currently in a calling that's confirmed or aspiring to a calling in the future. Father, would you help us know how to navigate news in such a way that we might not suffocate in our soul, but might actually be refreshed to see you at work in the world. And so grant us grace in these moments together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of the great moments of gospel advance in the early church is when Paul preaches his good news in the great city of Athens. And of course, we have Luke's account, his summary of it in Acts chapter 17. I think it's the longest recorded summary of a Paul gospel presentation. And in particular, we have this comment from Luke that is the preamble to Paul's sermon in Acts 17. This is verse 21 of Acts 17. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. What must that have been like? Now, I do not think Luke is impressed with the Athenian practice. It is not a flattering comment to say that they're spending all their time in nothing but news. Now, Luke is not known for overstatement. If anything, oh, I'd love to do a rabbit trail on this. Luke's glorious understatement throughout, which is so different than updates from 21st century church planters, exaggerating the numbers. <laughs> Glorious understatement in Luke. And yet, here we have such a strong statement, nothing but the news. If we ask Luke about this seeming overstatement, he might say that this bent in Athens, this orientation on new thoughts and new ideas and new philosophies had worked its way so deeply into their minds and their hearts and their habits that they, in essence, spent their life in nothing else. The spare moments they had went to the news. Their conversation drifted to the news. They started the day wondering about the news and went to bed at night thinking about the news and over meals, they talked about the news. The news had slowly and subtly and devastatingly taken over their lives, almost as if they had a magic newspaper in their pocket that updated throughout the day to inform them of new events and things to talk about. <laughs> However far we take it, I think it's clear that Luke's comment reflects he is not impressed. 
He is not commending this preoccupation and inundation with the new thing. Whether in Athens, it's new philosophy, new ideas, new concepts, or whether today, when we've rejected the noumenal world, and it's just phenomenological things like events and happenings. He's not commending this, but he's tacitly criticizing it and warning us against it. In fact, if Luke, maybe Paul too, were speaking to, let's say, some college students in Athens, he might plead with them not to waste their lives on all this news. Perhaps, like me, you grew up assuming, or maybe you still assume, that keeping up with the daily news is a good, respectable, even virtuous habit. Responsible people diligently apply themselves to expend daily effort to stay informed of the news, especially Christians and pastors all the more. I think that's a bad assumption. When we talk about the news, we typically have in mind the product that is produced by various professional agencies and services that generate daily and now instantaneous content. The nature of the daily news is as a product that comes at us at some cost. Though we may not be conscious of the cost. We might even assume the news is the news. It happened. Professionals are reporting it. What could there be to analyze or further consider about that? Well, many of us are now aware, more than ever, perhaps in these last few short years, that the news is not just news in the classical sense. It is a product we purchase, sometimes with our dollars, but always and most significantly with a more limited and valuable resource, our attention, right? In the last generation, we have seen the news go from daily papers to hourly television programs to now instantaneous feeds through the technology and internet, and social media that Tony and Samuel have talked to us about. So then, in considering the productized nature of news, we might ask, what does the product have to offer us, especially as pastors, and what might be its drawbacks? Let me start with four drawbacks, and then we'll spend the rest of the time on the offerings. First drawback, the dailiness of the news. Or better, now it's the instantaneousness of the news. 20 years ago, Florida professor John Somerville was talking about the periodicity. The very fact that it's daily means something about how we got to fill it up for the next day, how it's being delivered to us, that one of the greatest biases in the news isn't conservative or liberal, but the fact that it's daily, the dailiness of it. Dailiness is out the window now. Now it's instantaneous. The whole industry of daily news, including now the volunteer voices joining the stream without pay through social media, (laughs) competes for limited human attention and creates a rush to press that does not foster careful observation and the reporting of details of what actually happened and whether it is really worthy of occupying our attention, and whether the reader or viewer has anything they can do with that information. A second drawback is that in an effort to fill our daily and instantaneous appetites, the news gravitates to the most curious and fascinating stories, which increasingly happen in some place far, far away. Far, far away is how fantasy stories begin, right? And even if they are, even if the stories are in the same metro in our modern megacities, there is often little, if anything, we can do about them. 
I live in a metro here, Minneapolis, St. Paul, of three million people. Jeff Bilbro, in his book, Reading the Times, calls these distant dramas. Tony, Samuel, they recommended some books. I'd recommend Bill Bro's Reading the Times. For Tolkien fans, it's not Bilbo. Okay? <laughs> Bill Bro, Jeff Bilbro, Reading the Times. That book has perhaps informed me as much as any, I hope, the Bible more, but specifically for this message for you. Bill Bro quotes a lady named Barbara Klingsolver, who observed almost 20 years ago, after the death of John F. Kennedy Jr., she said, it's possible to be so overtaken and stupefied by the tragedies of the world that we don't have any time or energy left for those closer to home. The hurts we should be taking as our own. I can't help but read that as a pastor and think all the more for us pastors. Brothers, it is so easy to be overtaken and stupefied by the tragedies of the world so that our time and energy for our own people, the ones that we have been called to lead and feed, is severely compromised. Third drawback to the news as product. And this relates to our information overload in our day, over choice. One of the great dangers of our time is learning to keep our heads and our priorities and balance in the overwhelming glut of information. German philosopher, Josef Pieper, three decades ago, before the advent of the internet, said that the average person of our time loses the ability to see because there is too much to see. And brothers, our ability to see is so precious as pastors. To see, really see, in God's word. To see in our own souls. To see what's really going on beneath the surface, not just on the top level, in our churches. And in our world, as pastors of all people, we cannot let the glut of information, so much to see, keep us from truly seeing at depth what we are called to see. One final drawback then is that news unavoidably traffics in ephemera. Are you with that word, ephemera? It's information that's here today and gone tomorrow. Reports that are ephemeral. We use the adjective more often. Ephemeral in nature. In other words, trivia. It's a more common word. When you're producing news in real time, you have very little context to discern what truly matters. You don't know amidst the many things that happen today, and you only know a very few of them, What's most important and worth reporting? Time will tell. Many things the news reports prove over days and weeks and months and years to be genuinely important. That good citizens and good pastors might benefit in some modest ways from being aware of. But much of it, might we even say most of it, will prove ephemeral and trivial. Which means that in some sense, feeding daily on the news inevitably habituates our souls to trivia. At least when you watch a movie or a well-done documentary, you're seeing a product that took months to put together. It's been done very intentionally. You've had to do all weeks of cutting. When you watch the news, you are consuming a product thrown together in just hours, if not minutes. So how might we think positively then about the news, given those four drawbacks? That's really what I wanted to get to. The news can provide us 
with an opportunity, with biblically informed eyes to consider God's work in his world. And here's where pastors might have a particular opportunity to lead the way in helping our people with how to engage the news, with Christian order and balance and context. But it begins first in our own souls. One way to get at this at a Bethlehem conference might be to ask a WWJED question. What would Jonathan Edwards do? (laughs) Does he, of all people, have anything to say to us about the news? And Edwards may be especially helpful since he lived a century before the telegraph and the roaring revolution the telegraph, telegraph brought to daily news. News in Edward's day was markedly different. Yet, he served as a pastor in New York. This is 1722 to 1723, right when he was done out of Yale. And he had there, in that port city, access to regular news. Though, of course, not nearly the flood we have today. Here's George Marsden's report about Edwards related to news. Another book recommendation, Marsden. (laughs) Living near the docks in this seaport town of New York enhanced Jonathan's keen interest in world affairs. As with everything else, he saw world events as merely outward signs of spiritual realities of what God was doing through human history. During his stay in New York, he began making entries in his notebooks on the mysterious revelations of the last book of the Bible as a framework for understanding current events. This subject soon became a lifetime preoccupation. As he recalled of his New York days, here's Edward's own words about his New York days. These are the ones that are most important. If I heard the least hint of anything that happened in any part of the world, That appeared to me, in some respect or another, to have a favorable aspect on the interest of Christ's kingdom, my soul eagerly catched at it. And it would much animate and refresh me. I used to be earnest to read public newsletters, mainly for that end, to see if I could not find some news favorable to the interest of Christianity in the world. Now note, he is making entries in his journal to reflect deeply on these things. This is a different pace than we might be used to today. But provided that there is space for adequate reflection, there is a vision here for redeeming the news. And that is, view it deliberately and unapologetically through the lens of Christ in his kingdom. So, given the drawbacks, on the one hand, and given Edward's example, how might we, as pastors, engage the news in such a way that it does not suffocate us, but refreshes us, that it does not conform us to the world, but opens our eyes to God's work, that it doesn't pull us down and make us groaning pastors, but lift our eyes and our hearts and help us do our pastoral work with joy so that we might be of an advantage, not a disadvantage to our people. That's Hebrews 17. Hebrews instructs the congregants that they should do their part so that the pastors do their work with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you, church. And we as pastors, supposed to overhear that, and hear how important it is that we do our labor gladly. Brothers and sisters, we cannot let the news rob us of our joy for ministry. When we access news, we want it to animate and refresh our souls, as it did for Edwards, so that we might be workers with joy for the joy of our people. So how then might news refresh 
rather than suffocate our joy for the good of our churches. Give you three orienting ideas. Number one, priority. Priority is God's news first. When we first get up in the morning, we often find in our souls an urge for something new, something fresh. It's a new day. What's new for today? I do not think that that desire for something fresh in the morning is a sinful desire. I think God put it there. He designed it for himself to come first to him in the morning through his own words in scripture and by the life-giving power of his Holy Spirit and to find new mercies at the outset of each day in the old, old story. So we dare not replace the sweetness and the substance of God's voice first thing in the morning with productized, marketed news. How tragic to aim our God-given desire for new morning mercies at the world's report on its patterns. Rather than letting the world's news set the mood and the tone and the terms of our day, we want our God to speak first into our souls. We prioritize him through his word. And when he has fed our souls and decidedly set the mood and the tone and the terms of our day, then we're more ready as the day unfolds to navigate the world's news with a full heart and with a level head. Another way to frame it is, where do we go to set our minds? You know that language of set your minds, right? Brothers, sisters, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on the earth. It doesn't say to reject the things of the earth that come at us, but that's not where we go to set the mind. We set our minds on our risen, reigning, glorified Christ sitting at God's right hand. Where do you go first thing in the morning to set your mind for the day? As Christians and as pastors all the more, we want our best, most focused, most engaged moments of the day, typically the first moments of the day, with the help of coffee, perhaps, to be an unhurried season away from noise, away from distraction, in which we steep our souls in the word of the living God. It's telling that G.W.F. Hegel in the early 19th century said that reading the morning newspaper is the realist's morning prayer. Realist was his term at the time. We might say secularist today. The secularist awakes to the world's news. The Christian awakes to Christ. Marvin Olasky, who worked in news for decades as the longtime editor of World Magazine, gives this caution. He says, if we're more desperate to keep up with the news than to keep up with the Bible, it's not the gospel we trust, but our Facebook feed. So first, brothers, are you keeping up with the Bible? That's number one, prioritize God's new mercies daily. And that priority then leads secondly to proportion. And by proportion, I mean access world and local news with balance related to other inputs. This is proportion. Access world and local news with balance related to other inputs. Notice here the, the, uh, the accent on access. There is just news that you can't help. It's going to, if you are in community, if you have not gone away to Walden Pond for years, like there is news that's going to come to you as part of being in relationships. 
Here I'm talking about what you do intentionally to access world and local news. Proportion relates to being in the world and not of the world. Love the reference to John 17. Or better, we might even say, not of the world, but sent into the world. Jesus is praying for us as we're sent into the world. Proportion means finding the balance of how often we access the news and for how long and what sources and all the while counting the cost of what we're not giving our mind and heart to in that time. Olasky counsels that we learn to hear the news without being occupied by it. I think that's helpful. It's going to be different for different people. Hear the news without being occupied by it. And I will not pretend to know what that is for you. We have various callings and capacities and temperaments and sensitivities. And we find ourselves in different seasons of life. And even different days of the week might look vastly different. You might reasonably check in on local news more often if there's a riot in your city. Speak from experience. Or if a global pandemic descends, that might draw you into more news than usual. But as a pastor, charged to work for the joy of my people with joy, I want to keep asking the Edwards question, where do I see God at work? Not that I make public pronouncements about my speculations, And am I being animated and refreshed for spiritual purposes? Or am I becoming burdened and depressed with distant dramas I can do little, if not anything about? For 2,000 years, the pastoral vocation has consistently trafficked in books and sermons. Brothers, we are on good, solid, time-tested ground when we give the lion's share of our spare moments to reading books and carefully preparing sermons for our people and also in hearing sermons and even writing at length. It is far from established that the work of our vocation transfers well to the new media. I would grant that some efforts by some pastors may be worthwhile for experimentation, but not by way of transfer or replacement. I mentioned a lot of books here today, aren't we? Mid-80s, Neil Postman. Amusing ourselves to death. It is in the context of his chapter on religion and it's with reference to sermons in particular that Postman observes, not all forms of discourse can be converted from one medium to another. We should hear that well as pastors. And when Jeff Bilbro gives counsel for an online diet, his summary is, avoid marshmallows, and eat vegetables. And when you ask what vegetables are he, is he referring to, he defines that as long form essays and books. I'd only add sermons. In terms of proportion, Bilbo suggests, sorry, <laughs> Bilbro, <laughs> I'm reading The Hobbit aloud to my daughters right now. Bilbro suggests we would be wise to spend at least, and perhaps more like two or three, at least one minute, perhaps as much as two or three, reading books or meaty essays. That's his encouragement. Books or meaty essays. For every one minute that we spend scrolling through a news feed, listening to the radio, that's getting drawn in now, or surfing around the internet, checking on the latest news. And I recently heard uh, Alistair Roberts make a similar suggestion. He just said straight up three minutes on something more substantive for every one minute in news and social media. He had a three to one ratio he encouraged. 
And as pastors, we have an opportunity on Sunday mornings to model for our people how little the daily trivia that fills our people's week matters in light of eternity. At our church, we do not pray the latest news every Sunday or mention fresh stories regularly in the context of worship. We want our people to have Sunday mornings as a respite, a shelter from the storm of the trivial, instantaneous news that drowns out so much of their week. And so we try to saturate our welcomes and our prayers and our preaching and our teaching in God's word and in the eternal good news, not endless references to ephemera. <clears throat> in John Piper's first sermon at Bethlehem Baptist Church, this is July 13th, 1980, he quoted from longtime pastor of First Baptist Dallas, W.A. Criswell, who said this. I'll try to quote it without sliding into a Texas accent. When a man goes to church, he often hears a preacher in the pulpit rehash everything that he has read in the editorials, the newspapers, and the magazines. On the TV commentaries, he hears the same stuff over again, yawns and goes out and plays golf on Sunday. When a man comes to church, Actually, actually, what he is saying to you is this. Hear this, brother preachers. Preacher, I know what the TV commentator has to say. I hear him every day. I know what the editorial writer has to say. I read it every day. I know what the magazines have to say. I read them every week. Preacher, what I want to know is, does God have anything to say? If God has something to say, tell us what it is. I'm so thankful that John Piper did that for 33 years at Bethlehem Baptist. So priority leads to proportion. Then proportion, we might say, is best worked out in the context of a good plurality. This is where we finish. By plurality, I mean flesh and blood, embodied, real-life humans, consistently in our lives, committed to us and our good, whether in families, our churches, or fellow elders. It's plurality. We need post-Zoom embodied communities that help us recognize when we're beginning to lose our balance related to the news, one way or the other. But especially for pastors, Plurality means our fellow pastor elders, the plurality of leadership in the local church has a critical role to play in our engaging the news well and not falling into unhealthy extremes. We need to speak into each other's lives as pastors on this very issue. Maybe you, as a fellow elder, you or a fellow elder, are becoming jaded and becoming unhealthily disengaged from the world. I doubt that's the most acute temptation for most. Or maybe you or a fellow elder are being pulled too much into the wormhole of daily news and you need your fellow elders to help bring you back to your calling as a pastor to feed your people and tell them what God has to say. And then, as we pastors are among our people. So important. He, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 5, he said twice in the first two verses, the elders among you and the people are among the elders. Among, very important. As we are among our people, and not just fellow elders, we not only model this for our people, but we also get our bearings in relation to the real live flock God has given us. Whether your church is a rural or urban, small or large, young or old, we'll make a difference on this score. To close, back to freeing some of you, maybe, who do not now feel refreshed by news, but suffocated by it. As a human and as a Christian 
And as a pastor, you are not responsible to know everything about anything. You are not responsible to know something about everything. You are not even responsible to know something about many things. You are called as a pastor by the risen Christ to know his word and feed his sheep. Our people desperately need us to know the Bible and God's good news backwards and forwards. Our people are living in a noisy, distracting, interrupting, demanding, unnerving, oft, often suffocating era of almost suffocating news. And they need us to be men of God's word and men of the gospel. They do not need for us to know the news better than them or even as well as them. But they do need us to know them and to live among them and graciously and untiringly tell them what God has to say. You pray with me. So Father in heaven, without any pretense that any of us in here have figured out the perfect proportion and can recommend that proportion for anyone else and have worked it all out in our own plurality and context. Father, we want your help. We can see the errors at both extremes. We know you have called us. You have taken us out of the world and sent us into the world as your emissaries and all the more as pastors. And we want you to give us bearings and do so through the priority of your word and gospel, the good news, and through the accountability in real life rough and tumble with fellow pastors and with our people. So grant us that grace in these days to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.